It's Monday, February 14th, and this is now on HNN. New into our newsroom overnight, police are searching for a suspect in a deadly Waipahu shooting indicating that Russia is still open to more talks. The clock is ticking for a diplomatic solution to avoid war in Ukraine. So I don't know if you could have written any better. We'll hear from Super Bowl MVP Cooper Cup on the Rams' victory. Purchase some flowers for my beautiful wife. Love is in the air. Details on how much people are spending on this Valentine's Day. It's a love day. These stories and more coming up on This Is Now. Good afternoon. Thanks for watching. This is now. We want to get started with a still developing story. Honolulu police are searching for a suspect after a deadly shooting in Waipahu overnight. It happened just after 11 p.m. Authorities said the suspect and the victim got into an argument which escalated into a shooting. The suspect then fled, according to police. First responders found the 27-year-old victim on Hono Wai Street, right by the elementary school there. The victim was pronounced dead at the scene. Police have not identified the suspect yet. No other injuries were reported. This story is still very much developing. We're going to keep following it and bring you further updates on your h and digital platforms. The U.S. warns Russia could invade Ukraine as soon as this week, but officials are hoping diplomacy can prevail. So for the latest on the situation, let's bring in Hawaii News Now's White House correspondent, John Decker. Thanks for being with us, John. Now, you know, at this point, is an invasion inevitable or is Russia still open for talks? I don't think it's inevitable. And the reason I say that is the remarks that were made today by the foreign minister for Russia, Sergei, Sergei Lavrov, today, indicating that Russia is still open to more talks and they'd like to have more talks, trying to bring some sort of diplomatic solution to the crisis that we see right now in Ukraine. In the meantime, you have the defense secretary traveling to Europe to meet with his counterparts in Europe, uh, preparing for the possibility that Russia invades uh, Ukrainian territory, its sovereign territory, this week. And there were talks over the weekend, right? Did, was there any progress from that? There were talks. There was another conversation that took place between President Biden and President Putin. Uh, however, the White House indicating no progress was made uh, in terms of bringing some sort of diplomatic solution to this crisis. Uh, but I would not uh, forestall the possibility of additional talks either between President Biden and President Putin or at the Secretary of State level uh, with uh, Secretary Blinken and his counterpart, Sergei Lavrov. Do we know what the end game is for Putin? You know, why create this crisis and bring all these troops to the border? Uh, what does he gain from this? Well, in a perfect world, what he would like to see is a change in leadership in Ukraine. He'd like to see a, a pro-Moscow government in uh, Kiev rather than what exists right now under President Zelensky, which is a pro-American, pro-Western, pro-NATO government. Uh, I don't think he gets that without invading or threatening to invade Ukraine. But uh, beyond that, I, I think that one of those impacts of all of this troop buildup has actually brought NATO closer together. I don't know if President Putin realized uh, that would be uh, a side effect, essentially, uh, in terms of what he's done over the past few weeks. Yeah, that's very interesting. Uh, let's turn to a topic closer to home here. So what's the latest on President Biden's nominee to the U.S. Supreme Court? Well, we don't know who the nominee is just yet, Ashley. We learned over the weekend in an interview that President Biden did with Lester Holt of NBC News uh, that he has narrowed down his list of nominees. Uh, it's down to four individuals. They are vetting those four individuals. And the president also indicated that by the end of this month, uh, he will name his nominee. And of course, that individual will make history. It will be the first uh, African-American woman, the first black woman uh, who will be nominated to sit on the U.S. Supreme Court. Right. And we're learning about new developments with the January 6th Select Committee uh, and one of President Trump's allies, right? 
We're learning about the possibility that Rudy Giuliani, the former mayor of New York City who served as the personal lawyer to former President Trump, uh, has been asked to meet with the January 6th committee. His attorneys uh, indicating that a meeting was supposed to take last week. It was postponed, and the reason being is his lawyer has indicated that Giuliani wants to cooperate with the committee. What that looks like, we don't know. I think a big part of this is he doesn't want to go down the same road, for instance, as Steve Bannon, who defied a subpoena issued by the uh, committee and is now facing a criminal trial uh, later this summer. So, uh, after all, Rudy Giuliani is a member of the bar, doesn't want to be disbarred by perhaps defying a congressional subpoena, and I think that would be one reason for the cooperation with the committee. All right, lots of developments. We'll be watching Hawaii News Now's White House correspondent, John Decker. Mahalo for your time. And we have this new video to show you, U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken back in D.C. now. You know, this weekend he was on Oahu. He met with representatives from Japan, South Korea to discuss the threat posed by North Korea. We condemn the DPRK's recent ballistic missile launches and its unlawful nuclear and ballistic programs. Uh, which are clear violations of UN Security Council resolutions. And we have a couple of updates to pass along regarding the state's tourism industry. Halfway through the month, arrivals by air seem to be finally topping 20,000 most days. Last Thursday saw 24,000, suggesting a modest bump up for Valentine's Day. We'll hit 300,000 arrivals for the month late today or early tomorrow. Now, more cruise ships are arriving in the state this week. The Ruby Princess Tuesday and the Grand Princess on Friday. Another ship's final port is today on the Garden Isle. Former state Senator Kalani English will plead guilty to taking bribes. And because of that, he will likely avoid losing his pension benefits. That's because a bill designed to combat political corruption was watered down by lawmakers last year. Rick Dasog has more. Senator English. Back in April 2021, former state Senator Jay Kalani English voted on a bill that would allow a judge to take a government employee's pension if they were convicted of a felony. It was a reform measure introduced in wake of the Kealoha scandal, but the bill English voted on was a watered-down Senate version, allowing a judge to garnish only half of a public employee's pension if convicted. When the bill moved over to the Senate from the Finance Committee, it required garnishing 100% of a convicted felon's pension. Bottom line, when the bill came back, those provisions were gone. Former city council member Ikaika Anderson believes English had a conflict of interest when he voted on the measure. At the time of the vote, English was apparently aware of the federal investigation because FBI agents had stopped him and local businessman Milton Choi in Choi's car three months earlier in Kaka'ako. They also allegedly recorded him taking a $5,000 bribe from Choi. Certainly you don't vote on legislation uh, that would affect you. Federal prosecutors allege that English and state representative Ty Cullen took the bribes in exchange for introducing then-killing legislation favorable to Choi's industrial cleaning company. Both are expected to plead guilty on Tuesday. While Cullen could lose his pension after he's convicted, English will likely be able to keep his. That's because the Senate tucked in language saying the law, quote, shall not apply to felonies committed prior to the effective date. That law took effect in June 2021, or about six months after Choi allegedly paid his final bribe to English. If the intent is to garnish the pension of a state pensioner convicted of a felony, then garnish the pension, the entire pension, and have the bill apply to anyone who committed these felonies, rather than to forgive any prior felonies that occurred before the act was passed. English and his attorney could not be reached for immediate comment. Rick Daysog, Hawaii News Now. Now to the pandemic. The state health department is reporting 498 new COVID infections today. The breakdown of cases include 228 on Oahu, Kauai has 101, and the Big Island and Maui are reporting double digits. While things seem to be easing up here at home and on the mainland, 
parts of Asia are being hit by record numbers of coronavirus infections. Christy Lou Stout has more on what's happening in Hong Kong. Here in Hong Kong, the healthcare system is overwhelmed as the city is hit with a record surge in COVID-19 infection. On Monday, Hong Kong reported over 2,000 new daily COVID-19 cases and 4,500 more suspected cases. This is a significant rise from the previous day. Hospital beds for COVID patients are at 90% occupancy. Isolation facilities are nearing their maximum. Now, after a government meeting between Hong Kong and mainland Chinese officials in Shenzhen at the weekend, the Hong Kong government said that Beijing would help with testing, treatment, and quarantine capacity. In fact, task forces have been announced, but it's not clear when Hong Kong will approve the funding or how quickly help will arrive. Now, late on Sunday, the Hong Kong government said that children from age three would be able to get vaccinated starting on Tuesday. And this follows the death of a four-year-old who had tested preliminary positive for COVID-19. Now, officials also warned that food supplies may be disrupted after truck drivers responsible for transporting food into the city tested positive. Hong Kong and mainland China are among the few places in the world with this so-called dynamic zero COVID strategy, a policy designed to suppress every outbreak. But according to Hong Kong's number two official, John Lee, there are so far no plans to lock down the city. Obviously, how things are run and practice in the mainland uh, may have to be modified a little bit if it is to be applied in Hong Kong. Uh, that modification may or may not uh, affect the effectiveness uh, or efficiency of the whole uh, arrangement. So it may, there may be uh, possible areas that uh, some of the um, strengths in the system uh, can be maintained by dividing uh, responsibilities and functions uh, between what are those that are best to be taken in Hong Kong and what are those that may uh, best be done uh, as background support in the mainland. Tough measures are already in place. Among them, schools are closed. Gyms and entertainment venues are closed. There's no dine-in service after 6 p.m. There's a ban on social gatherings of more than two people. There are also the strict quarantines and border restrictions in place. Two years into this pandemic in Hong Kong and its dynamic zero COVID policy are being put to the test as COVID-19 cases here exponentially rise. Christy Liu Stout, CNN, Hong Kong. Thanks for that update. And you know, this morning on Sunrise, I was listening to Howard Dykus' business report, and he was talking a lot about Japan and the prime minister having some news coming out over the weekend saying he's willing to start considering easing restrictions, which of course would be huge implications yep. for our tourism industry here, but gave no timeline or framework of how that would work. Yep. But just a little indicator of some change there. Some winds of change on the horizon here at home. Some weather conditions might be shaking things up a little bit down the road in your work week. Here's Guy Hoggy with an update on that. Now there is a juicy disturbance just to the northeast of the Big Island, and that's why there's a higher chance for showers for the east of the state today. But then drier conditions for the west end. But by Wednesday, that disturbance drops in a little bit closer. We're talking about more widespread rain from Wednesday all the way through Sunday. Scattered showers, most of the showers light to moderate. We're not looking at a washout. It doesn't look like real heavy rainfall, but there could be some moderate uh, intensity rainfall coming in all the way through the weekend as well. Although it looks like by Sunday, it starts to ease up somewhat. So we're in for a long stretch of really ni a nice weather. Granted, that does include stronger trade winds starting to pick up on Wednesday. Those breezy winds will run to Saturday, but that will help limit the rainfall because even though the rain starts to ramp up on Thursday, it's still going to be windy. So whatever rain comes in will be moving along rather quickly. So enjoy the beautiful weather, especially for today, Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day, everyone. If you've seen the Netflix show Love is Blind, Tinder is introducing a new way to date but on your phone. The dating app unveiled Blind Date. And here's the deal, there's no photos, just a chat at first to encourage users to talk before they can see what each other looks like. Anyone who tries this new feature will answer some questions and based on the responses, they will see answers from their potential matches. 
They can choose to chat, and if after they both swipe right, their profiles and photos are revealed. Tinder says it's led to 40% more matches than the fast chat feature. Love is in the air and those roses are on the way. Sammy Selena joins us now with more on what people are spending on. Watanabe Floral Store was packed with bouquets. In the past week, they've made 5,000 arrangements. Today alone, they'll do 800 deliveries, and they've already done 1,200 early drop-offs. What we do is we start planning in, in last summer. So it's about seven months of planning, making sure that your numbers are tied in, making sure you have access to flowers, which come in from all over the world. All of these roses you see come from South America. So it's figuring out what farms to get it from and how we're going to actually get it here to Hawaii. They expect this to be a record breaking year. They've already sold out of day of deliveries, but they are ready for anyone who wants to come in for a last minute bouquet. Came to purchase some flowers from my beautiful wife. She's very generous. She's very kind. She's loving and she does everything for me. It's a love day. You know, it's a love day. You so to show everybody who you care for that you love them. And this is what this is for. Staff here tell me that part of the reason they're having such a successful year is because, unfortunately, other florists had to shut down because of the pandemic. Sammy Solina for This Is Now. All right, this is going to be the last week of the Olympics. Let's get you another update. Let's take a look at that medal count. The U.S. has snuck up into the top three. We now have 16 medals total behind Norway and the Russian Olympic Committee. We finished fourth in the last winter games in Pyeongchang. A ruling from an international court on the fate of a Russian figure skater who tested positive for a banned heart medication in December. Nathan Hodge has the latest from Moscow. The crisis in Ukraine may be front and center in international affairs, but another story is sweeping the headlines in Russia. After figure skater Kamila Valieva was cleared to continue competing at the Olympic Games in Beijing. On Monday, Kremlin spokesperson Dmitry Peskov welcomed the move, saying that all Russians were cheering for Valieva and hoping that she would go on to win at the Games. But the Games are taking place against an atmosphere of heightened international political attention, it tensions, with Russian officials even going so far as to claim that they believe that the tensions over Ukraine are being stirred up by the West in an attempt to cast a pall over the Olympic Games in Beijing. But as the world's eyes remain on the Games and Russians continue to cheer for Valieva, she will be going on to compete in the women's individual competition, which is slated to begin on Tuesday. Nathan Hodge, CNN, Moscow. Now today at the Winter Olympics on KHNL, Michaela Schifrin competes in the women's downhill, plus snowboarding's best go big and go for gold in men's big air. Now that's today on KHNL. Fresh coverage kicks off at 3 p.m. All right, the internet is definitely buzzing about the Super Bowl and oh, the yeah. Olympics, so what else can you talk about? And they collided yesterday in one of those rare events where the Super Bowl and the Olympics were on the same day, right here on KHNL. Mm -hmm. And you know, the Super Bowl often sort of is like a reunion of all the big athletes out there. And yesterday, there were some fresh Olympians already in the crowd. So check out this picture from the socials. We've got... Chloe Kim, you see her there celebrating in LA. You see who she's next to? Oh, that yeah. is superstar DJ Steve uh, Aoki, who's from right here on the island. And he posted this picture and he even called her his little sis. You'll recall just one week ago, she finished victorious at the halfpipe finals for snowboarding. So she's already made it back to LA and having a good time there. Moving on to another social media picture. This is Sean White there. We all saw his career come to a wrap up during the Olympics last week. Well, he made it to SoFi Stadium and hit the field. He's got the best view in the house, it looks like, and throwing up a peace sign there. And then you know, people who were actually in China, the Olympians that were in China for Beijing's Winter Games, they really wanted to watch this too, right? So it was actually due to the time change. It was Super Bowl Monday. It, it was actually aired at Monday in China in the morning. And everyone joined up there at the NBC Production Studios. And there was a really quick, quick, quick glimpse of them. But Nathan Chin was even there in the crowd of people watching. Oh, yeah. You gotta can't miss the game and the halftime show. No way. What a halftime show. I know. Though, right? I wish it was much longer. Yeah, and it did go by so it was fast. Too, too I quick. honestly, it was almost emotional. Like, it, it gave me chills. It mm -hmm. was great. Yeah.
All right. So we're also talking about a big press conference that just wrapped Yeah, up. so the Super Bowl MVP Cooper Cup was at a news conference this morning to talk about the big win, and here's some of what was said. You're a team that recently moved to L.A. How important was it for you all to win this Super Bowl for your fans and those that believed in you who remained faithful to the franchise and those newcomers that we actually got to meet yesterday, a few that lived around Inglewood and now are fans of yours? Yeah, you know, that's. I think it's been such a cool thing. The, uh, you know, I think the original L.A. Rams fans, you know, have kind of grown up. They were younger when L.A. was here, and now they've, they've got families of their own. And so now we'll come back to L.A. and, um, you know, those fans that now have, their parents have been Rams fans for a long time and, you know, f you know, parents, grandparents, whatever it is, and now being able to raise up a new generation of Rams fans as well and um, to be able to, you know, in five years be able to bring a, a championship home to this city, um, I think that's just, uh, you know, it's, it's a, a great thing about the city is what the city demands. And, uh, you know, to be able to bring that home, first, first year opening up SoFi with fans, uh, being able to win it, at home in SoFi, uh, there's just I don't know if you could have written any better. You got to give those guys a lot of credit to be able to get seven sacks was instrumental for us winning that. A huge thing coming into this is you know so many guys just said hey we we've got guys here that deserve a Super Bowl we got to win this for them and um, you know Coach touched on just how guys play for each other and uh, that makes uh, that's what kind of makes this team so special. Coach sounding a little hoarse there. Yeah, lots of yelling. Yeah, we just got this new video in as well. This is the host committee for Los Angeles officially passing off the event, the Super Bowl, to Arizona, which is where it will be held in 2023. Glendale. Yeah, great arena. Yeah. And so Sunday was a big night for LA Rams wide receiver Van Jefferson, who is now Cute. both a Super Bowl champ and a new dad. Now his wife went into labor in the middle of the game, while he was doing his best to beat the Bengals on the field, Jefferson posted a photo on Instagram after the big game showing him cradling his newborn baby boy. Now, his caption simply stated, quote, times two, and that's a reference to the fact that he and his childhood sweetheart are also parents to a five-year-old daughter named Bella. You can imagine all that excitement watching your oh, husband yeah. there on the I bet the wife labor. was so torn about yeah. leaving. Or, like, in her hospital room, put it on the right. TV. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, we got to talk about this ad. This ad it wasn't necessarily funny, but it's making headlines today. You know, everyone's paying almost $7 million for those Super Bowl ads yesterday. And this one may have been worth every penny. Coinbase, Coinbase app crashed briefly on Sunday after a surge in traffic. It's a cryptocurrency exchange app. The 60-second ad featured a floating colorful QR code, and it was bouncing around the screen. And that just that's what caused everyone to go to the app and try to download it. Yeah, they got 20 million hits in one minute alone. The chief product officer took to Twitter saying that it's a historic and unprecedented response. Uh, yeah, I would think so. It was kind of genius. Yeah, I mean, if you want people to interact with your ad, those QR yeah. codes, we haven't seen that before. So. And I mean, that whole thing, that's so nostalgic, you know, for a lot of us. Oh, yeah, Pong. Yeah. Pong. Yeah, yeah that's or what ping. it was. Pong, yeah. Pong. One of those. <laughs> so if you're watching the Puppy Bowl, you saw a former Maui shelter dog had her moment in the spotlight. So Hoku had a starring role in the Puppy Aww. Bowl. The Staffordshire Terrier Catahoula Leopard Mix, she's less than a year old, and she's the first Hawaii pup bowl player in the Discovery Channel's event raising awareness about animal shelters. So she was born at the Maui Humane Society's Pu'unene shelter in May and ended up getting adopted by her trainer's parents in Connecticut. So Hoku was on Team Rough, that's with Martha Stewart, but they got beat by Snoop Dogg's Team Fluff. You know, I'm a big Martha fan, and she looked amazing. She was did some great does. social media posts, too, all day long of the Super Bowl. Yeah. And her, she had a great trip. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> you guys, that's going to do it for this.